we carry on with First Peter. In chapter 1, verses 3 through 9, Peter praises God the Father for the, the blessings of the new birth that he in his great mercy has given to Peter and to Peter's readers, his immediate readers, and to us. He brought them into a vibrant and meaningful hope, the substance of which is an inheritance that is eternal, precious, and without diminishment, a tremendous salvation that will be fully and finally revealed at the time of the final judgment at Christ's return. Though now they're being mistreated, they're suffering persecution, they're facing hardship for their faith, on that great day of salvation they will rejoice like never before. They will rejoice with just a tremendous joy. And Peter explains that the various trials they're suffering that they would serve to prove the genuineness of their faith, which faith will be richly rewarded on that day of Christ's revelation. It will result in, in their receiving from God praise, glory, and honor. I mean, what a, what a delight, what a joy that is. And then he digresses to accentuate, in verses 10 to 12, to accentuate further the greatness of this salvation that he's speaking about. And that's where I want to pick back up in verses 10 to 12. It says, concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace to come to you diligently searched and carefully inquired, inquiring into what time or what sort of time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating when predicting the sufferings coming to Christ and the glories after these things. It was revealed to them that they were presenting these things not for themselves but for you, which things have now been announced to you by those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, in which things angel, into which things angels long to look. So Peter highlights the greatness of this salvation that he's talking to them about. He highlights that by noting that the Old Testament prophets, who through the Spirit foretold of the coming of this great salvation, that they were so taken by its glory. You know, we yawn at it. We hear about it. We just, we, they were so taken by its glory that they expended themselves in trying to discern the time or the general period of time when the means and the grounds of that salvation that is, the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent exaltation which they were predicting, when those things would occur. This salvation is so tremendous that they spend themselves in trying to discern the time of the coming of the Christ who is the ground of that salvation. That is what they're looking at. And there are numerous references in the New Testament to the Old Testament's prediction about Christ's coming and Christ's suffering. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 11, verse 13, that all the prophets and the law prophesied until John, meaning the entire Old Testament had a prospective or a forward-looking aspect to it. And in Matthew 5, 17, it shows Jesus is the fulfillment of that prospective, forward-looking aspect of the Old Testament. We see in Luke chapter 24, verses 25 to 27, and he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets... He interpreted to them in all the Scriptures the things concerning Himself. Luke 24, 44 to 47. Then He said to them, 
These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance and forgiveness of sin should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. Acts 26, 22 says, To this day I've had the help that comes from God, and so I stand here testifying both to small and great, saying nothing but what the prophets and Moses said would come to pass, that the Christ must suffer, and that being the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light both to our people and to the Gentiles. That's Paul, and Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 to 5, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, He appeared to Cephas and then to the Twelve. Wayne Grudem, in his commentary on 1 Peter, Grudem says, in this sense of the entire Old Testament being writings of the prophets, The predictions of the sufferings of the Messiah begin with the prediction of the seed of the woman who would be bruised in the heel by the serpent in Genesis 3.15 and continue through much of the Old Testament writings. And in fact, we spent I don't know how many weeks when we looked at Jesus in the Old Testament, had an entire series on that, eight weeks, ten weeks, I don't remember, but it was a good while. The Messiah's subsequent glory is predicted in Psalm 2, 16, 10, and on. So the, the New Testament is clear in its reflection, see, that these Old Testament predictions about Christ. And in 1 Peter, he's saying that these prophets who were saying these things, they expended themselves looking for the time when these things were going to occur. The Holy Spirit, who inspired the Old Testament prophets... And here he's called the Spirit of Christ. You see that he's called that in Romans chapter 8, verse 9. And you see other uh, names of the Spirit. Just more unusual names for the Spirit in Acts 16, 7 and Galatians 4, 6 and Philippians 1, 9, 1, 19. And he's called the Spirit of Christ because he is the same Spirit who was sent from Jesus. Jesus ascends and he is the provider and sends the Spirit, as you see in verse 12 and in Acts chapter 1, verses 4 and 5 and Acts 2, 33. And he bears witness to Jesus. He's the Spirit of Christ because he's sent from Jesus and he bears witness to Jesus and glorifies Jesus. There's a uh, Jim McGuigan years ago wrote a book called uh, Where the Spirit of the Lord Is. I think that's the title of it. Yeah, Where the Spirit of the Lord Is. And there's a section there where he talks about the Spirit that I've always enjoyed. He says, The Spirit brings glory to Christ by refusing to put himself on center stage. Whatever the Spirit does and however he does it, it is to be understood in light of Jesus' own proclamation, he will bring glory to me. We've all known people who were the dynamic behind whatever was going on. And while we knew they were at work, they didn't parade or proclaim their presence. They were hiding in plain sight. They did their job so well that people looked at what was being accomplished more than at the prime mover in the venture. The Spirit of God models this behavior for us. He doesn't want first place because there's no life without Him. Because we have no Christ without Him. Because He does so much, we're tempted to forget why He does what He does. The Spirit does what He does to glorify the Christ, to bring the Christ, to represent the Christ. He never parades His own presence, even though He insists that we know He is present. And when the Spirit leads people to speak and they cannot speak without Him, they speak of the Master and not of Him. The Spirit suffers from no identity crisis, yet you never hear Him say, Behold me! Rather, over and over and over again He says, Behold Him. To say we shouldn't glorify the Spirit would be nonsense. To say we shouldn't delve into His nature and work would be sheer ignorance. But one of the reasons that less has been said about the Spirit down the centuries than about the Father and Son is because the Holy Spirit 
unceasingly pointed to the Father and the Son, that he himself should be praised and glorified is only proper, but it honors the Spirit when we pay attention to the focus of his work in the world. He's not the focus of his own labors and pointing away from himself. The Spirit is not putting himself down. He is exalting the Christ. And I think that's an important perspective. And I think here when you see the Spirit of Christ, he is the Spirit of Christ in that Jesus is the one who sends the Spirit, but also the Spirit glorifies the Christ. And so I think that's something useful to recognize. Now these prophets, they sought to discern when their predictions would be fulfilled. Presumably they did that by investigating the times and the circumstances of their own lifetimes and by reflecting on prior writings, prior prophetic writings. So they would, they would inquire into their own times and circumstances. They would reflect on prior prophetic writings and or they did this by seeking wisdom or further revelation from the Lord. You see an example of that in Daniel chapter 12, verse 8. But in any event, they're interested in this. This salvation is so great that the ground of this salvation, this Christ who's coming, when is this going to happen? And they were no doubt hoping that this great work of God would occur in their lifetimes, that this work of God about which they're prophesying, that it would be fulfilled in their days. But it was in fact revealed to them that the prophecies were at least primarily for those like Peter's audience. So they're writing long ago. They're searching diligently because of the greatness of the salvation about when the ground of, of this salvation is going to appear, these things they're prophesying about. When is it going to happen? But it's revealed to them, in fact, that it's going to, the prophecies are at least primarily for those in Peter's audience, those who lived on the other side of the Christ event. So here's Peter writing to these Gentile Christians who are being persecuted, and he says, you are, you are the ones. You see, all of these prophecies were, were focused on those who live after that event and who had this glorious news of his crucifixion and exaltation announced to them through the Spirit-inspired and Spirit-empowered preaching of the gospel. They long to look into when was this going to happen, but it's you. It's you who are the heirs and the beneficiaries of all that they were. You lived in the time and are now having this tremendous salvation explained and preached to you. See, God's redemption of sinful humanity through the atoning work of Christ an event now having occurred in history, when the Old Testament prophets are saying it, it hadn't yet occurred. But now having occurred in history, it is a subject so sublime that angels, <laughs> angels long to look into it. Angels long to explore the depths of it. And we yawn at it. We, you know, it's, it's like, uh, you know, I, I just, I'm, I'm here, here so much, I'm just tired of it, bored with it. And we're talking about something that's just mind-blowing. That angels want to explore its depths. They want to dig into it and find out what's happening. Thomas Schreiner says, The privilege of enjoying and anticipating salvation comes to the forefront. Old Testament prophets saw it from afar, and angels also marvel when gazing upon what God has done in Christ. But the Petrine readers actually experience it. Peter's immediate audience, and that's us, we, we get it. We experience it. And then he says in 13 to 16, Therefore, therefore, having bound up the loins of your mind, being sober, set your hope fully on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not conform to the former passions when in your ignorance, but like the Holy One who called you, you also be holy in all your conduct. For it is written, 
Be holy because I am holy. So given the greatness of this salvation that he's talked about, he wants to impress upon them this is not a yawner. This is something that is tremendous. And given the greatness of the salvation in which they participate, that's why he says, therefore, given that fact, they need actively, they need to affirmatively set their hope fully on the gracious blessings to be given to them at the revelation of Jesus Christ, at the second coming of Christ. And this involves preparing their minds to do so by having a sober grasp of their salvation. Having a clear understanding of what that salvation entails. It involves appreciating the certainty and the greatness of that salvation. When one grasps the blessings that are in store for the faithful in Christ, one is strengthened to live in the light of that expectation, prepared to have one's present life shaped by that hope. You see, when we recognize that we have a clear grasp of this, when we understand what is in store for us, that then factors in. It's not simply academic. It's not pie in the sky. It then reflects back into how we live. Because we see. We see what he has in store for us. Setting one's hope fully on the blessings of the eschaton. On the blessings of the end. Setting one's hope fully on that. It goes beyond simply expecting those blessings. It includes choosing to live in light of those blessings. Okay, it's not simply expecting them. Setting your hope fully on those things is choosing to live in light of the tremendous blessings that are in store. Choosing to live a life that is pleasing to the provider of those blessings. Doesn't that make sense? Isn't that how that should factor into our lives? That we should then choose to live in a way that glorifies the provider of those blessings? So they're called in verses 14 to 16 then to live holy lives. Those Christians and we are called to live Holy lies because the God who called them to salvation, the God who is all the one behind this, who has accomplished this, who's doing this, it is because he is holy, then they are called to be holy. Christians are to be holy, he says, in all their conduct. In all their conduct. No area of life is exempt from this directive. There is no area of life in which we are free not to be holy. Not to conduct ourselves in a holy manner. That's why it's just so sickening every time you turn on television. You see these so-called Christian people living the way they do. You see, living lives like the world committing adultery, doing all this other stuff. And it's just outrageous. Now, when you speak about holiness, what does this mean to be holy? Although holiness applied to God, right? We know God is the holy one. And holiness applied to God, it involves his total distinctiveness. It is his total otherness. All that distinguishes God from everything else. His complete distinctiveness. So there's a sense of speaking about the holiness of God in that way. But the stress about the holiness of God is often on his moral and ethical distinctiveness. His moral and ethical distinctiveness does not exhaust his distinctiveness. 
But oftentimes in speaking of holiness of God, the stress is on his moral and ethical distinctiveness. He's set apart in that he is perfectly and infinitely good and righteous and just and faithful, and kind, and loving, and forgiving, etc. Right? He's not just bigger than we are. He's better than we are. He's better than we are. And this stress is seen, this stress of holiness of God on his moral and ethical distinctiveness, that stress is seen in the contrasting of his holiness to sin. For example, in Habakkuk chapter 1 verse 13, after referring to God in chapter 1 verse 12 as the Holy One, the prophet then says, your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrong. Isaiah chapter 5 verse 16 says, but the Lord Almighty will be exalted by his justice And the holy God will show himself holy by his righteousness. Okay, so I understand that ethical and moral distinctiveness does not exhaust God's holiness. But oftentimes the focus and the emphasis is on his his moral and his ethical distinctiveness. His righteousness. His goodness. And so when we think about Christians and holiness... Well, Christians, there's a sense, of course, in which we are holy, right? We are holy. That's a fact statement. We are holy in that we have been set apart. We have been made special, made distinctive through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. So we are distinguished. We are set apart for God's purposes and work. By this. So there's a sense in which we are holy. We are uniquely related to God in that we have received the holy cleansing through Christ's sacrifice. As the Hebrew writer says down in verse 10, by which will we have been sanctified, holified. Okay, we've been sanctified through the suffering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. So there's this sense, of course, in which we have been set apart by God's work, and we are distinctive in that. In fact, in chapter 1, verse 2 of this letter, we've already seen, he said that election is in the sanctification, the holification of the Spirit, in that those who come to faith are sanctified by the Spirit. We receive the Spirit. And we are thereby set apart for God's purposes and blessings. In fact, the word that's, the word that's translated saints, right? We always talk about the saints, the gathering of the saints. We're the saints. Paul writes to the saints. What that word means is holy ones. So of course there is a sense, right, in which Christians are holy. And you have to understand that, recognize. But there's also a sense in which we are called to be holy. Right? We are holy in the fact that God in His work has set us apart and distinguished us and made us distinctive for His purposes and calling. But then there's a sense in which we are called to be holy because God is holy. We're not called to be holy as God is holy because we couldn't do that. Nothing can be holy as God is holy in the fullness of the sense of the term. But we are called to be holy because God is holy. And this means that we are to be morally and ethically distinct from the world because God is that way. As I say, the the emphasis often on his holiness is on his moral and ethical, his betterness. And so we are called, we are holy, but we are called to be holy in that we are called to be morally and ethically distinct from the world. This aspect of holiness, you see it, for example, in Romans six nineteen. He says, Paul says, For just as you presented your members as slaves to uncleanness when you weren't Christians, and lawlessness leading to lawlessness, so also now 
present your members, your body parts, as slaves to righteousness leading to sanctification, leading to setting apart, leading to holification, leading to this morally and ethically distinct life that conforms to the distinctiveness that you have by virtue of God's work in your life. You are saints. You are called to live like saints. You are called to have a harmony between who you are and how you're to live. These things are to be together. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 3-8. to Paul says there, for this is God's will, your sanctification. You must abstain. This is his will, your sanctification, your holification, how you as a holy and redeemed person are to be. He says, for this is God's will, your sanctification. You must abstain from sexual immorality. Period. That's how you're to be. I don't, you know, well... I don't know, Joe over here at some university says the Bible doesn't say that. I don't care what Joe says. Everybody understands this throughout history. And the fact in the 21st century I have clowns telling me that's not what it means. It just doesn't, you know, you can do anything you want. He says here you must abstain from sexual immorality. Each of you are to know how to control his own vessel In sanctification and honor, not in lustful passion like the Gentiles who do not know God. That that one not wrong or take advantage of his brother in this matter. For the Lord is an avenger in all these things, as indeed we previously told you and warned you. For God did not call us to impurity, but he called us in sanctification. That's how we're to be. Therefore, the one who rejects this does not reject man, but God, who also gives you his Holy Spirit. So he he calls, he says, this is how we're to be. And then he says in 17 to 21. And since you call upon a father who judges impartially according to each person's work, live in fear during the time of your sojourn, knowing that you were redeemed from your empty way of life inherited from your ancestors, not with perishable things such as silver and gold, but with precious blood, as of an unblemished and spotless lamb, the blood of Christ. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was revealed at the last of the times for your sake, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave glory to him so that your faith and hope might be In God. So, given the fact the Heavenly Father they call upon is one who judges impartially according to each person's work, and thus is one who will not wink at rebellion or defiance from anyone. Right? This is the kind of God he is. He judges, he judges impartially according to each person's work. So he will not wink at rebellion or defiance from anyone. They need to live in fear, given that. They need to live in fear of the consequence of defying God. That needs to motivate them. I know, I know fear of God it has a terrible reputation in quarters, but it's all over the Bible. See, they need to live in fear during their sojourn in fear of the consequences of disobeying and rebelling against God. In other words, they can't presume on their relationship with God and imagine that that relationship frees them to disrespect or to mock God in the way they live. Now, this is a message that Christians need to hear because we have Christians who live as an insult to God, who live like, listen, I don't care. I'm just so happy I'm saved. And then I go and I spit at God by living however I want instead of living a consecrated life that says to God, thank you. Thank 
thank you. No, 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 I'm just going to say that's great. I'm glad to have Now let me just go and live any way I want. What is that? That's complete nonsense. You're just making up your own religion. I mean, you're free to do that. But don't take the name of a good and noble religion. Don't do that. Karen Jobes, in her commentary, she says, The pagan life that God abhors will be no less abhorred if it is lived by one who professes to be a Christian. That's the point. There's a God here who judges, who doesn't exempt you from the consequences of rebellion and defiance. And so you should think because you profess to be a Christian, that's your ticket to live any way you want to? Of course not. Of course not. Thomas Schreiner, in his commentary, he says, There is a kind of fear that does not contradict confidence. A confident driver also possesses a healthy fear of an accident that prevents him or her from doing anything foolish. Right? It's useful. It's beneficial. I fear the consequences of an accident. I might hurt myself. I might hurt other people. So I'm aware. I I fear this. And he says, a genuine fear of judgment hinders believer from giving into libertinism. This idea that it doesn't matter how I live. Praise God, I'm saved by grace. It doesn't matter how I live. That's just nonsense. It's just nonsense. Are you saying that your life earns and achieves anything? Have you ever been in my class before? If you've been in my class, you know I'm not saying that. You know what I'm saying is that there is a genuineness to faith. There is an allegiance to faith. It is not simply an intellectual thought of, I believe these things. I intellectually assent to these truths. It is a surrender and a submission to those truths. And if you have a surrender and submission to those truths, that will inevitably play out in your life. You will not stick your tongue out at God. Why? Because I have faith in Him. I trust in him. I have given him my life. That's what it's about. That's what I'm talking about. He says the background to such fear can be traced to Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 4, 10, 8, 6, and the wisdom tradition, Proverbs 1, 29, Job 28, 28, you see the text there, where the fear of the Lord informs all of life. All of life is informed by this Fear of the consequences of rebelling and rejecting God. That's not, that's not bad. That's not sub-Christian. That's perfectly right, perfectly good. As I say, it's all over the Bible. Now, we're not to fear men, right? We're not to fear men when they seek to bully us from faithfulness to God, as our culture is increasingly trying to do trying to push you off, trying to embarrass you, trying to get you to say, no, 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 yeah, I'm sorry, you know, Jesus, yeah. We're not, to, we're not to give in to fear. We're not to fear men when they do this, right? But we must fear God. You see, we're not to fear men. Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill us, or rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Acts 5, 29, Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than men. I don't care what you're doing. You know, this will cost you your job. Well, then it's going to have to cost me my job. This is going to cost you. I, well, you know, it's like, I've already decided that. I've decided that. I have took Jesus as my Lord and Savior. So whatever the consequences, I'm in with it. Easy for you to say, right? But I'm telling you, that's the truth. That's the truth. And he says, Hebrews 13, 6, so we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Ultimately. Well, they do this, do that. I understand. I understand. I don't make light of it. I know there are pressures. What I'm saying to you, the reality and the truth is, is that we do not fear men. We fear God. And we live for God. And that's what we're to do. We have to do that. I mean, that's all over the Bible. You see in Psalm 111, 10, says that fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. When Paul says of people in Romans chapter 3, verse 18, that there is no 
fear of God in their eyes. That is not a compliment. When he says there's no fear of God in their eyes, it's not a compliment. Indeed, Peter commands them in chapter 2, verse 17. He says simply, fear God. Okay? This righteous, wholesome fear of what God does to the rebel. What is in store for the defiant? We need to keep that in mind. And the motivation toward holy living, that's provided by a sober awareness of the dreadful consequences of defying God. That motivation toward holy, righteous living that is provided by that awareness of the dreadful consequences of defying God, it is reinforced or multiplied by an awareness of the breathtaking price that was paid for our redemption. Right? So I have that there that's motivating me. I'm aware of that. What is in store for the rebel? What is in store for the defiant? But that is multiplied when I realize and reflect on the breathtaking price that was paid for my redemption. They are to live knowing that their deliverance from the empty way of life they had inherited as Gentiles, a way of life that degraded them and held no hope for eternal life with God, That redemption was purchased with something more precious than all the wealth of this fallen, decaying cosmos. It was purchased by the supremely precious blood, by the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now that ought to motivate you. That ought to do something to you. When you say the relationship I'm in, all that I, my life, my standing before God, my now, my future, it is all purchased for me by the sacrifice of the holy, sinless, righteous, perfect Son of God. A blood so precious, it just blow your mind. Well, that ought to do something, Right? How am I to live then? It's just like if you don't live in an awareness of that, it's like you're trampling on that blood. Like you're saying, I don't care and it doesn't matter. His blood was analogous. He says, as of, when he says here, as of an unblemished and spotless lamb. His blood was analogous to that of an unblemished and spotless lamb offered in sacrifice under the old covenant in that his blood was poured out for the benefit of others. His life was given for the benefit of others. His life was given for me. And so he's, he, Peter's saying to them that you are called to live holy. You are to be holy because the God who rescued you is holy. He calls you to live this way. And by the way... He calls you to live this way in light of the judgment that will come on the defiant, but also in light of the fact that the blood that bought you is supremely precious. So this is something to motivate and to inspire. Now the incarnation of God the Son, the Word, see, in the Trinity, the incarnation of God the Son as the God-man Jesus. Okay, so God the Son becomes the God-man, Jesus. But the incarnation there and His accomplishment, accomplishment of redemption for mankind through His atoning death and resurrection, that was known by God from eternity. Right? I mean, this, is, this has been known by God that we're going to have the incarnation That God the Son is going to enter into this world as the God-man Jesus. So that's been known from eternity. 
but he was revealed, he came in the last times, in the last days, in the sense that he inaugurated the kingdom of God, he ushered in the new age, the new age that marks the end of the old age in principle and the beginning of its end in fact. I've mentioned to you before many times, in fact, how the Jews understood God's final judgment and his remaking of the world. And they looked at it this way. This is from James Dunn. James Dunn was an internationally respected New Testament scholar. He died a few years ago. And this is from his book. He says, see, the present age, it's a little bit blurry because I had to blow it up, but it's the present age you have. Their view was we have the present age going, we have the end, and then we have, that's the end point, we have this, this intervention, the final intervention. So we just have life going on as it does, God's intervention, and then everything goes on in the eternal state. So it's a one-shot deal. That's how Jews pictured eschatology. And that's, what, that's how they envisioned it, and I think that diagram there, it captures it. But the New Testament, Jesus corrects this. You see, the New Testament teaches that the kingdom of God, the age to come, was ushered in or inaugurated in the Christ event, in his coming, his death, his crucifixion, his resurrection, his ascension, but its consummation awaits his return. So as Preben Vang and Terry Carter explain in their book, their book, Telling God's Story, the Biblical Narrative from Beginning to End, according to Jesus, the kingdom of God is already here. Jesus inaugurated it. The age to come is broken into the present age. God is making his present felt already, yet the kingdom of God is not here in full. Evil still exists. God does not yet fill all in all. This will only happen at the time of consummation when Christ comes back. We now live between the times. We live in an overlap of ages. The kingdom is a present reality, but we still experience all the marks of fallenness. Death, suffering, mourning, decay, crying, pain, all of that. But yet the kingdom is a present reality. But a day is coming at the second coming when all that's contrary to the eternal purpose of God will be stripped out and the kingdom of God will be the sole reality. That's all about Revelation 21. There'll be no death or mourning or crying or pain. Do you think God has established this to go on forever with death and mourning? The answer to that is no. The answer to that is no. Here's what Michael Byrd, he puts it. I could multiply these things. I could give you dozens of these. From New Testament scholars, Old Testament scholars, it doesn't matter. What I'm telling you is nothing sneaky. It's recognized by everybody. Says your Michael Bird, fundamental to Paul's theology is the future age, the eschaton. Let me read this quote and then I'm done. Fundamental to Paul's theology is that the future age, the eschaton, has already broken in and has been inaugurated through the life, death, and resurrection of the Son of God. The coming of Jesus has inaugurated a new era of redemptive history, and God's new age has been launched upon the world, something like a covert operation seizing key nodes along the, near, the rear echelons of an opposing force. Those people who confess faith in the Messiah and experience the transforming power of the Spirit of God are living billboards in our global metropolis, advertising God's activity in the world and pointing to things soon to come. At the same time, the old age continues... Death and evil are realities that need to be confronted and endured, but their power has been broken in principle and even in practice. What is more, the day is coming when God will finally do away with them and the old age will be no more. On that day, God will be all in all. Here's a diagram that Dunn puts of that idea. You see how it goes along. There's the crucifixion. The age to come has been pulled into the now. Present age continues. At the end, the present age ends, and we have then the eternal glory. We are in that overlap of ages. Okay, over time, thanks.